You can ask her why breakups suck or why you've hit a plateau. Inquire all those questions you've always wanted to know. Ask Katie anything. Hey everybody, we are back. It is our second episode of Ask Katie Anything. And I am here with a bunch of more questions. You guys have a lot of questions. And I hope that you're kind of liking this. It's fun to to get to see what you're wanting to know more about. It also tells me like what other videos I might want to make. Um, and it's also just nice to be able to roll through questions and give you more. I don't know. Sometimes I think I wonder if when I'm putting a video together, I like put too much thought into it, which I know just seems counterintuitive and doesn't make any sense. But sometimes I wonder if I put like I think about it too much. And I want to make sure that's like just right for you guys, you know, and in therein, I, I mess it up and it gets too clinical or it's too focused where this is almost like my old FAQ style where I could just get to like riff on things and tell you what I think. And sometimes I think that I hear from a lot of you that that makes for better advice and, and more insight, you know, like a new way of thinking about something. So I hope you like this. Um, if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. And, uh, you know, leave a little comment. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can comment below. But if you're listening to this, you can also leave five-star reviews. Um, and you can review the podcast on the, I think it's like the Apple Podcast app kind of thing. Um, and that really helps this be more discoverable for people. Without further ado, because I'm rambling, I apologize. Let's get into your questions. Question number one. Katie, how do I deal with atypical anorexia and not feeling ill enough? Now, I hear this a lot when it comes to eating disorders specifically. I'm sure there are other mental illnesses where we feel this way, but eating disorders specifically, for some reason, we feel that we need to be a certain amount of ill. And I'm just putting that in like air quotes. If you're not watching, just listening, I'm doing ill in air quotes. And the reason I do that is because everybody is different and there's no certain amount of illness that we have to have in order to warrant getting help. We all deserve help, okay? I just want you to kind of hear that because I think the mental illness stigma not only prevents us from getting help in the beginning because we're like, ooh, what are people going to think about me if I'm in therapy or see a psychiatrist? What does that mean? But then even if we want to get help, then we can, like, there's a sec second layer of worrying that we won't be ill enough for treatment. I don't know. I just want you all to know that you can get treatment anytime. There's no, like, you have to be ill enough. There's no, you do have to meet certain criteria for certain diagnoses, but that has nothing to do with you getting help. Okay. Now that I've ranted and raved about this, when it comes to atypical anorexia, if any of you don't know what this person's referencing, um, most likely they have a lot of anorexic, uh, the anorexia nervosa symptoms. However, um, often with atypical anorexia, it ends up falling into the diagnoses of uh, what used to be known as EDNOS, eating disorder not otherwise specified. But now we call it OSFED, and it's otherwise specified eating or feeding disorder. I don't like OSFED. I just don't like the way it sounds, but that's what this would fall into. Because if we don't meet certain criteria, uh, being like less than 85% of our ideal body weight, um, or like, let's say it's bulimia we're talking about, and you're not binging and purging and like as many times to meet the diagnostic criteria. So long story short, atypical anorexia, I'm guessing this person doesn't think that they, they're, uh, they weigh a low enough amount. Maybe they don't, they haven't reached 85% or less of their ideal body weight. And ideal body weight is not something that you make up in your head, by the way, because some of you are probably doing that, running your calculations. Don't do that. You have to talk to a doctor, a medical doctor. They get to tell you what your ideal body weight is. And that is based on like your bone density and your age and your physical activity level and, you know, all sorts of things. Because BMI is bullshit. Throwing that out there too. That's just garbage. Don't listen to it. Don't calculate it. It does no good. It doesn't take anything into consideration other than your weight and your height. And that's just stupid. Okay. So I think with the atypical anorexia, just like any eating disorder um, in general, to be honest, it's all about self-talk. It's all about recognizing that eating disorder voice and telling to shut the hell up because it'll tell you so many lies. It always tells you, trust me, even if you weren't diagnosed with atypical anorexia and you had anorexia nervosa as a diagnosis, your eating disorder voice would still tell you you're not sick enough. It's never enough with an eating disorder. 
Did you hear that? It's never enough. So how do you deal with it? You go in to see a therapist and you notice that eating disorder voice and you tell it to shut the hell up. And even if you don't mean it, try not to listen to it and you have to fight that voice. And that's really part of recovery. I think that that's like how we start recovery anyway. So it's a great starter just to start noticing what thoughts end up making you feel worse about yourself. And my guess is 99% of those are eating disorder thoughts. So recognize them, fight back, don't believe. Thoughts are not facts, remember? Thoughts are not facts. So yeah, cool? Okay. I like how I'm pretending that I saw you nod or something, <laughs> but I hope on the other end you're nodding and you were like, yes, <laughs> good. Because we're going to move on to question number two. Now, question number two is, Katie, how do you deal with clients who don't make progress or continually self-sabotage? I have BPD and so many therapists have gotten frustrated and irritated with me uh, for this and basically made my BPD reactions and outbursts worse by seemingly abandoning me. Now, I want to uh, draw a, like, shine a light on the fact that this question, in this question, the person said, I'm BPD. You're not BPD. You're whatever your name is and you're doing wonderful. BPD is just one of your diagnoses and it doesn't define you. And it, it just is part of who you are. So I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. And I corrected it when I read it. I will admit I said I have BPD because that's how we should talk about it. Okay. So to the question, um, there's a couple of ways. So depending on depending on the, the, the person, um, if a client's not making progress, and it's happening for it's happened for a really long time. Let's say I've been working with them for like a year. And in the last like three or four months, they haven't made progress. And we've tried like adding in another therapist because sometimes I'll be like, oh, go to this group therapy. Or if trauma's in the picture, I'm like, hey, see this trauma specialist. Maybe try EMDR or schema therapy or something. So I'll refer them out for a more specialized treatment, thinking that maybe that will help them move forward more quickly. Because we have to figure out why they're not making progress. And sometimes, especially with my BPD patients, they're afraid that if they do better, then they won't get to see me anymore. And it's that fear of abandonment. And I'll always bring that up because if you don't know, I do dialectical behavior therapy um, as well as CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. I do those two types of therapies in my practice mostly. Um, and therefore, I end up with a lot of uh, patients with BPD, borderline personality disorder, and eating disorders and self-injury. Those are kind of my, it's my wheelhouse, okay? So... I check in on that. I ask them if they notice they haven't made progress because there's no secrets in therapy. Don't think that I'm thinking that you're doing wonderful and I'm not going to tell you or I think that you're not making progress and I'm not going to tell you. I think the cool thing about therapy is that we get to actually have those what you would normally consider like a really difficult or maybe uncomfortable conversation. We get to have those things. We get to practice it. It's great practice for life and other relationships. And so when it comes to um, to this I would bring it up. I'd want to know kind of why we might try outsourcing to other things. And then if it just doesn't seem like they want to get better, which is fair, right? We can't, no one can force us to get better. We have to do the work ourselves. And that's why therapy is really hard because no one can like fix it. It's not like going to, um, you know, your general practitioner doctor where they're like, oh, you've got this infection and here, we're going to give you this and the infection is going to go away. When it comes to mental illness, because it, a lot of it is thought-based, behavioral-based, we have to work and fight those thoughts to not do the thing that we don't want to do anymore. And it's like really difficult. But having extra tools and techniques and support can make it a little easier. So um, back to the question, how do I deal? There are times when I will, uh, if I don't think they're ready, like I was talking about, if I don't think they want to get better, they're just not at that point yet then I might tell them that, you know, let's take a break. And I know when it comes to this, because she's saying like, it triggers my BPD tendencies, like she thinks she's being abandoned. I always had this conversation with my patients. I say, you know, um, we can take a break because it seems like you're not quite at that point to get better. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here. However, it's not worth your time and money to come in here if you're not getting any benefit, you know? sometimes that will kick them into gear. And all of a sudden they'll be like, oh no, I do want to get better. But you know, we have to kind of toe that line of like, do they, are they working in therapy with me? Because a therapist can't work harder than a patient because I can't make them get better. But are they, because it's okay to plateau for a while. I don't want you to think that I'm like, oh, they're not making progress. Get out. That's not how it works. But 
um, I can like take a little break for a bit and then we can come back around um, or we can just check back in. Sometimes just talking about it kicks them in the butt and they get their shit together. Sometimes not. And then if the self-sabotaging is happening, I think that is an issue that we have to work on as therapist and patient. That's something that I would want to talk about. I want to better understand. Do you not believe it? a lot of it comes down to worth, especially if we struggle with BPD. We think that we're not worthy of love. We're not worthy of, of true relationships. There can be a lot of things, a lot of assumptions that we make. And so, yeah, I guess because I'm rambling and I'm sorry, but I guess long story short, I would check in about why, like the progress, I'd bring it up, try outsourcing, maybe try taking a break and then talk about if it's self-sabotage, talk about why we think that's happening. Is it one of those faulty beliefs? So in CBT, um, one of the techniques is like downward arrow questioning. I think that's what it's called. I might be messing up the wording, but it's, you ask us essentially, you know, let's say that I have a faulty belief. that's like, I'm not creative. Okay, Katie. So if you're not creative, then what? Well, then it means that I, I'm not any, I, I'm not any good at my job. Okay. So if you're not any good at your job, then what? And we go down, 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 down. This can take a while also. Not everybody has answers to the questions. Sometimes I get two questions deep and my patients are like, I don't know. And the, you know, we're done with it for that day. But you're trying to get down to that core uh, faulty belief that we're essentially acting out of. It's like a false, we have almost like a false sense of self to some extent where it might be, if my, I'm not creative, might really mean to me, I'm not good enough or I'll never be good enough, or something like that. And so that's where I would go with that self-sabotage. I'd be more curious about where it comes from. Why are we doing this? What do we believe about ourselves that is then turning into actions and causing us to not have the life that we deserve? And so, yeah, I mean, I think for this person who asked this question, because you have BPD, it could be really helpful to find a DBT-based therapist in your area or online um, because they get it. They get it in a new way or attachment based. That also really helps. It's going to be uncomfortable at first because you're going to want to push through those boundaries that the therapist has placed because BPD, we can't help ourselves because um, we're sensitive. We feel things out. And when we feel like we're being pushed out, we see boundaries as abandonment. But it'll be really, really helpful and healing for you to cultivate a you know healthy, happy relationship with the therapist and better understand boundaries and attachment, all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, maybe try to see a specialist. And I'm sorry that you're dealing with that because, yeah, therapists, uh, and not all therapists know how to manage people with BPD. I'll be honest. We, they, you don't always get the best treatment because people, ha there's like a stigma, a double stigma with it. And I'm sorry. I'll, I'm doing my best to like let people know that it's not terrible. It's something that can be managed, especially if we want to get help, right? Nothing can be managed if we don't want to get help. So anyway, okay. Let's get into question number three. Is it truly possible to fully recover from a mental illness or is it like asthma where it's um, always there but can be managed? So you always have to be aware of it, but there are times that it doesn't flare up and you can live a normal, healthy life. Or can it fully, fully go and someone can come to live, full, live life fully without having to worry about depression, anxiety, or an eating disorder again? I love this question. Um, the truth about it is that the more correlations we can draw as people between mental illness and physical illness, the clearer the picture will get. Meaning to answer, like to shortly answer this question, a mental illness can come back. If we don't take care of ourselves, right? It's like catching a cold or getting the flu or like asthma. It has to be managed. But I don't like to compare it to asthma as much as I do because asthma um, in many ways can be like a chronic illness. Like I had sports induced asthma when I was like a younger kid. It was because my dad smoked. I think that's what my doctor told me. I don't know if there's any correlation, but it made sense. So I had that when I was like 12 or 13 and then I grew out of it miraculously. But for a lot of people, it's something that's long term. It's something that we deal with for the rest, like potentially for the rest of our lives. However, when it comes to like the flu or a cold, or we could even say like a broken leg, right? So when we have something like that happen, we're ill for a little period of time. And if we take care of ourselves, we take our medicine or we go see our doctor, right? We do all the treatments we're supposed to do. Then we start to feel better and then it goes away, but it can come back. If we aren't sleeping, eating well, you know, we're not taking care of ourselves. We're living this high stress life. I don't know. There's a lot of things running ourselves, you know, burning the candle at both ends as my mom likes to say. So then it can come back. 
And that's how I like to think of like, let's say just depression or anxiety or eating disorders as if we don't take care of ourselves, it will come back. But it's not like a chronic illness. Um, Most mental illnesses are not chronic like asthma where it has to be managed all the time. There are some like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Um, Those can be, they can need medication management for, for most of someone's life. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be in therapy working super, super hard. There can be a a period of time where all of a sudden we're like, hey, you know, I get my mental illness. The medication that I'm using is working for me. It's managing my moods and I feel pretty regulated. I feel pretty good. I have my tools. I know what to notice, like what symptoms of mine come up. That means I either need to take better care of myself, sleep more, talk to my psychiatrist, all sorts of stuff. Um, we can know that and then we don't have to be in therapy as often anymore. So it's more managed with medication. And so I think that's kind of like the asthma. That would be a nice, um, you know, what would I even call it? It's like a, a good example, I suppose. But I don't know if I'm doing a good job answering this one, you guys. I'm sorry. But I feel like for most mental illnesses, other than a couple that are more managed, I really believe that we can get it to a place where it goes away and we live a full, happy life. Because sometimes it's just, I like to think of it like, um, like when you're, I don't know, like water skiing or you're in a boat, even better. We're in a boat in the water. And you know, when you first start the boat, it's going real slow and it's plowing into that water. It's like fighting against the water. And it's really hard to get the boat going quickly. You can't just like gun it. I mean, I'm sure if you have like a huge boat, you just like fucking fly. But for a little while, you're plowing into that water, trying to break it, right? Break through it. And then you get up on this plane. Once you get going fast enough, right? You plow, plow, plow. And then you reach the top, the plane of the water where not as much of the boat is in the water anymore. I don't know. It's probably physics or something, you guys. I have to check out a different uh, podcast or channel for that. But so you get the boat going and then it's on the plane and it's easier. And I think mental um, mental health and mental illness is like that. It's like at the beginning, it's, oh, it's so painful. It's going to be so hard. There's so much I'm supposed to do in therapy. Oh. And then we get up on that plane and we start to feel like, oh, life is pretty easy. But if we slow down, if we're not doing the things that we're supposed to do, if we're not taking care of ourselves daily, I know it's hard but we have to, then our boat can slow down and we can feel like we're plowing water again. It can be really difficult. And so I guess that's a long winded way of saying that a lot of mental illnesses, I believe we can 100% recover from, but it's something that if we don't take care of ourselves, it can come back just like any kind of illness. We're not immune from the flu just because we had it once. Maybe, you know, or if I could never get a cold again because I already had a cold and overcame it, that'd be awesome. By the time I was like two years old, I'd probably already have had a cold and been done. Um, But that's just not the way our body is. And so other than a few mental illnesses that require, you know, medication management, potentially long term, you can fully recover. Um, so stick with it. I promise it gets better. I think that's a really hopeful answer too, to be honest. I didn't think about it that way, but, but it is hopeful because you can get better. Um, we just have to continue practicing what we preach. And I know maintenance is really hard for people because we're like, but I feel better. I can't tell you how many of my patients will start feeling better and come to me and all of a sudden decide that they think they need to go off their medication and they, maybe they don't need to see me anymore. Like boom overnight. And I always listen And I say, I know that you're feeling better and that's great, but have you considered the fact that maybe you do feel better because of these things? You know, think about it because that might be the maintenance. You know, maybe it's you're on medication for a couple of years. I don't know, six months. We'll talk to your doctor. I'm not a doctor. But then, you know, maybe you have therapy once a week for a while, then you titrate down to every other week. Maybe you take a break, but you go back every now and again. We kind of have to have that checkup. We kind of have to do those things just in the same way for our physical health. We try to eat a well-rounded, balanced diet. We try to do some kind of exercise. We try to make sure we're getting enough sleep, drinking enough water, you know, taking care of ourselves. So, okay. But that's a good question and probably something that I could like really talk even longer about. Okay, let me get a drink of water here. Okay, question number four. And this one is good too, you guys. It is, how do you maintain your mental health when you are in physical pain? And I, if, if no one, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're out there and you're like, I've never felt pain. I don't know why that would be so difficult. Try to cl- uh, close your eyes with me for a minute and try to remember back to the last time you were sick. You had body aches, 
fever chills. You just felt nauseous. You got the cold sweats going on. You feel like shit. Now, I want you to imagine that. Remember how bad that feels. I know this is terrible. You're like, Katie, you always tell us to focus on the positive. But I think a lot of people can't understand what chronic pain is like. And this is probably the best analogy I can give you. Just so remember that last time when you felt super, super sick and terrible. And imagine that that happens every day. And no matter what you do, it keeps coming back. Right? The doctors could be confused. They think that you're like seeking certain kinds of pills. I mean, just imagine that for a minute. It sucks. So how do we maintain our mental health when we're in physical pain? There's a couple of things. Number one, if there's a support group, either online, on Facebook, they have great support groups there. I, I mean, potentially, if you like the people, you know, but, but I think it's a great way to connect over shared experience. I think this is a really great way to, to have that connection. And so I would encourage you to seek out other people who struggle with chronic pain because only those people know what it's like. And there's something so validating about having someone just get it, you know, versus potentially when we have a lot of physical pain for a long period of time, we can hear, we can have friends and family get sick of hearing about it and dealing with it, even though you're like, hey, I don't want to deal with it either, dude. Um, and we can have doctors question us, nurses think we're, you know, just seeking opioids. It's a, it's a whole shit show. So seeking people with shared experience, then also you should have a therapist. This is something that you should do, whether it's through online, like Talkspace, BetterHelp, I think because sometimes it can be hard to leave our house if we're in a lot of pain. I would encourage you to look into that. And I think doing the things that you can, like I'd, I would want you to have a huge list of things that you can do that feel good to you. And I want those to range from during your really good days when the pain is maybe only like a three or a four, all the way to your bad days when you're like, I can't deal with this. Oh my God. You know, it's so terrible. And have them kind of range in day and night. I want you to start putting those things together. And it can take a while to put that list together. And it's okay. And you can come back to it and you can change it and be like, oh, that one didn't work. I don't like that one. I'm going to add a couple more. That's all good. Um, but I do think that's something that you should have on hand. Maybe it's something you have up in your room that you put on the wall so that you don't forget. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can do. And I think when we have physical pain, we often remember, or not remember, we often are like stuck with the thought of like what you can't do because of it. Like, oh, if I didn't have this, I would. Da-da-da. And that's that negative thought cycle we get caught into all the things it's taking from us. And yes, I agree. It sucks. And I'm not trying to take that away from you or, you know, be invalidating. But I'm trying to tell you that, you know, we need to be reminded that we can still do some things and we still do have some control. And that can be so empowering. So I'd encourage you to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's really it. And finding a good support team, like a treatment team, meaning like your regular doctor, like your pain medic, your pain management doctor should be great. You should like them. You should feel heard. Um, your therapist should should understand you. you. Should have that group, people who get it. Yeah, and know that we all have bad days, and that's okay. Okay, question number five: Could you do? Oh, this is um, this is kind of funny because it asked if I can do a video. Because I didn't tell you guys what these questions were for. Sneaky sneak. Okay. It says, could you do a video about PTSD being passed down generationally? Is the Holocaust the only example of this or is it present in other instances? Oh my God. Okay. I love this question for many reasons. First of all, I'm going to do you one better. I'm not only going to do a video about it, but I'm hoping to write a book about it. And my proposal is sent out and people are reading and hopefully soon we'll have an answer that I can tell you like the book is being created because transgenerational trauma is what this is called when it's passed from generation to generation. People don't talk about this enough. And yes, the Holocaust is a great example. But um, even uh, having like my great grandma grew up in the Great Depression. I share this in the proposal. It might be in the real book. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but I, how she went through the Great Depression. And so growing up, she would like never want to throw anything out. And we go out to restaurants and she'd like take the salt and pepper shakers and everything and put them all in her purse. And she'd be like, you don't know when we're going to need it, you know? And as a kid, I was like, mom, great grandma Pearl is crazy. And my mom was like, no, no, no. She, you know, she went through tough times as a kid. And I was like, that's weird. But if my, you know, if there wasn't a real conversation to be had about that and everyone in my family acted that way and everyone around me acted that way, I would pick that up. I'd be like, I got to take shit with me because I don't know when I'm going to be without. And you just, you know, so 
um, PTSD and trauma can be passed generation to generation and also be passed out to people in our lives, like our friends and our coworkers. We can have, um, I don't think there's another word for it, but it's like, it doesn't have to be passed down. It can be passed out. And that really, it's like, think about how shared trauma is, right? For instance, I was walking on the street in my, um, in Santa Monica, where I live, super safe area for the most part. I've never had any issues with anybody. And I heard a couple of loud bangs. And I had this thought, you guys, I I have, have not been abused in my life. Okay. I have not been to war. I have not had uh, any kind of physical abuse, maybe some emotional abuse with bad boyfriends and stuff like that. But I, I've never looking back and being honest with myself, I would never think that I could be diagnosed with PTSD. Okay. I'm just being real with you. Definitely had depression, and anxiety symptoms, totally, um, definitely some OCD when I was a teen, but I do not have PTSD. And when I heard those loud bangs, my immediate thought was, should I run into this store and hide are those guns, are those like gunshots? Why would I have that thought? You know why? Because it's all over the goddamn news and media about shootings here and there. This is happening there. Somebody might drop a bomb on somebody. Else. I mean, it's just chaos. And I feel like that's that parallel transfer of PTSD that I, I had like a hypervigilant slash PTSD response to something when I don't believe I have PTSD, but that is a symptom, right? So yes. To answer this question, I'll definitely do a video. I'm going to write a book about it. And the Holocaust is not the only example. I think we share a lot of trauma um, because of the behavioral and emotional responses that we give to things. If everyone around me is hypervigilant, then it's going to be weird for me to not pick up on that, right? And not to act in that way. And so unfortunately, I think it's kind of an epidemic. But the more we understand it, then the more we can better, you know, uh, have tools to deal with it so that we don't continue passing it on to each other just like the flu or something we need to get a handle on it we need to talk about it in a real way and the responses um, from people out there needs to be I hear you let's figure this out I know this is a real thing not oh we don't talk about that or you're just overreacting you know and so I think the more that we talk about it hopefully the better it will get okay Question number six, what do you do if a client has a plan to kill themselves in the future? Like not anytime soon, but they have a plan for the next month, for example. Um, it depends on, depends on what it is. Now, you all know me if you've been watching my um, YouTube channel over the years. I'm not quick to put people in the hospital, call 911, 5150 people, um, mainly because I know it can be really traumatizing for people and I know it's really scary. And, um, and so the truth about this is I would want to know as much about it as I could. I'd ask them all the questions. I think the problem that we have with suicide here, and, and I don't know if it's, I think it's mostly worldwide, but especially in the States and especially in California where I practice is people are so afraid to talk about it. Oh, I don't want to talk about the suicide because I'll make it worse. You can't make it worse. That's not, uh, mm -mm. Actually, I think you make it better because uh, suicidal thoughts come out of like feeling hopeless. So if we're able to talk in a real way about it, ask questions, seek to understand. Don't jump to blah, blah, blah. Sorry. But don't jump to conclusions. Don't assume you know. And don't judge. Just listen. Let them tell you. So that's what I would do with my patients. I would ask, you know, um, I'm curious about this plan, you know, to kill yourself. What, what do you have planned so far? What, are, what, are the, what would you do? I let them walk me through it. Um, how come that's the date? Because I have a lot of uh, patients over the years who have a certain date. Like, oh, on my birthday or on the anniversary of something. It's usually a meaningful date to them in some way. Um, you know, it's been three years since such and such. They'll have this thing that they, and that's why. I'll ask about the date. I'll ask them what they hope to accomplish by killing themselves. Like, I know it's obvious that you're like, oh, they want to die. But no, sometimes it's something more than that. It can be like, I just want to not feel this way anymore. It could be, I want so-and-so to know what, what happened, how I felt. Um, if I can get any information out of them that I think could be beneficial for therapy, I'll try to work on that. Like, oh, you, um, you're sick of feeling this way. What about, have we considered medication? Have we considered a different type of therapy? Have we considered more therapy? Um, 
And so I'll try to figure that out. Or if it's like, um, I want so-and-so to know how much this hurt me, then I'll ask them if they're, they've tried to communicate, if there's a way that we could maybe get their, their thoughts and feelings across without having to take their own life. Um, I just, I'm very curious. And then I would put in, because, you know, suicide is a scary thing and, and we have to take it very seriously. I put together a safety plan. We try to figure out what the ne- the levels are because for those of you who don't know, um, as a clinician, if I do think that um, my patient is going to kill themselves, the threat is like imminent, they have the means to do it. You know, I'm checking all these boxes. If I feel like it's going to happen, then I am legally obligated to protect them the best way I can, which is 5150, put them in the hospital. And so I don't want to have to do that. That's the last resort, right? And so along those steps, you have um, putting together a safety plan, having them sign a no harm contract for that day, week, hour, I don't care. You can do text and call check-ins in between sessions. You increase sessions. Then we have people in their life that I can reach out to to make sure they're okay. So let's say I try to text them. They don't text back. Then I have your like approval, like a signed, um, you know, acknowledgement, even though they don't technically have to sign, but I usually like my patients too, just so they feel like part of it and it's not me overstepping bounds. But then I have these numbers or emails um, and people that I can reach out to so I can see if they're okay. I can check in again. So it's like, let's say I'm the one that um, has suicidal thoughts. Sean would be the safety contact. So my therapist would ha- would ask me like, hey, if I don't hear from you within two hours of texting, then I'm going to call Sean. And I would say, okay, I get it. Okay. Even though a lot of times my patients will be like, I don't want you to. I'll be like, well, give me someone else. Who else can I call? Because a lot of times it's parents or roommates and it has to be someone that can check on them that actually is local and, you know, can make sure they're okay. It's really just to protect you. And so I also kind of want to talk a little bit about, um, because I have a feeling this will kind of come up in comments, is um, kind of the conversation. Because I know uh, when I did the video with Eugenia Cooney, a lot of people didn't understand my role in it. And technically, my role was no role at all. Um, you know, you hear one person's side of a story. And as a therapist, I can offer my advice on like what the steps are you can take like I'm talking to you like if it was my patient, which Eugenia is not my patient, by the way, FYI. But there's all these steps that we take. And there's all these questions we ask and these things that we put in place to keep someone safe. And if their therapist or treatment team decides that they're not doing well, then they can decide to 5150 them. And that's really not has nothing to do with me. I know that people were very confused about that. I don't really know why. But I think that's the problem I have with online um, stuff is that people don't Maybe they're young, maybe they're uneducated when it comes to, you know, therapists, psychologists, but that like, she's not my patient. So it's not like, that's not my role. Imagine if every person that you've heard of as a therapist, other, someone else telling you, imagine if you are the person who's struggling and a friend of yours or a friend of a friend or someone that you kind of know says that you're ill. And then I, as a therapist can 51, can you imagine that? without even meeting you, without even knowing, that would be chaos. So that there are, that's why there are like laws. Um, there's confidentiality, there's HIPAA laws when it comes to like talking about someone else's medical issues. Um, yeah. So that's kind of, I don't know. I just wanted to mention that because there was a lot of confusion. People were frustrated and I frankly don't dive in the dirt with trolls online who, you know, want to share their quote unquote friends, personal information. I don't really think that's cool. You guys know I don't uh, talk about people's supposed mental illnesses online. That's their business. That's their story. That's not my story to tell. Um, so yeah, that that's why how it works. That's how the process is. Because at the end of the day, the, the goal, I think, of therapy and therapists is to protect their patient's privacy, but also protect their life. And so, um, yeah, so we have all these steps we have to take and things that we have to do. Um, but First of all, they have to be your patient and there has to be informed consent, meaning they're informed about all the laws and policies, privacy laws, policies of my office in particular, like you have to cancel at least 24 hours in advance, blah, blah, blah. Um, You have to pay at the time, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, And then they have to sign informing that they're consent for treatment and then you take them on as a patient. And if there is no informed consent, then I am not the responsible party, their their therapist, their doctor, their whomever is the responsible party. Okay. Now, question number seven. Is there anything practical or tangible that a person can do when having a terrible body image moment or day? Good question. I need something more effective than just repeating affirmations. I hear you. 
there must be something that can help. It's the biggest roadblock of my ED recovery and I cannot tolerate my body. So I give in to behaviors. Okay. Trust me. I hear this all the time. And the thing that's kind of crazy about our society these days, and so maybe it's social media, maybe it's just us, but we, I feel like almost everybody struggles with bad body image, but not everyone has an eating disorder. And that's when you're like, oh, they can give into behaviors and they're not getting better. And we just kind of spiral down, like kind of snowball into getting more and more ill. So the practical, tangible things are, number one, you distract like a motherfucker. And I mean that because eating disorder thoughts are like, they're so annoying. They just like keep going to say the same thing over and over and over and over almost like they're chiseling like breaking us down and so if we can distract so that we can't think those thoughts because for instance last weekend um and sorry I breathe funny when I'm doing this because I don't want <laughs> I don't want it to like breathe right in the microphone so I find myself holding my breath I'm sorry I'll get I'll get better this is still kind of new um but anyway so I um last weekend Sean and I went to Mammoth we love snowboarding we love the mountain fresh air it's amazing. When I snowboard, I can't think about anything else because then I'll fall down. I'll catch an edge. I won't pay attention. I need to hear if someone's coming up from, you know, behind me or if someone's cutting in, if the trails are merging, all sorts of stuff. And so I can't be thinking about other things. Now I know snowboarding is not a good example, but we need you to find some things that shut your brain down. What do you do when you like, what are some things you do that don't allow you to think about anything else? Tetris used to be a huge one for me when I was a kid. I fucking love Tetris. And that would keep my brain because it starts speeding up. <laughs> you got to figure out where that one weird, you know, it's like this shape kind of thing, where it's going to go. You got to figure it out. You only have a couple seconds, so get it together. So it forces you to, to not think other thoughts. This could be Um, listening to a podcast, reading a good book, um, coloring works for some people. It doesn't for me. My mind can just still go a million miles a minute. Um, since this is eating disorder based, I, I don't think I would put exercise in there. Um, but, hmm, I don't know. Try to think for you. Everybody's different. It, you know, go into the hobbies and things that you already enjoy doing and find the ones that take up the most brain space. Like uh, even for, I'm trying to learn French because um, if you guys don't know my husband, Sean, he is from Montreal. So that means that a large portion of the people that we interact with when we go there speak French. Um, His family also speaks English, but there's a lot of people who would prefer to speak French and I would like to be better at it. So learning French on my Rosetta Stone takes all of my brain energy. Like I legitimately can't think about anything else. So come up with some of those things. That's one practical or tangible thing to help with bad body image. Another wear super comfortable clothes. Don't wear anything fitting. And for the love of God, avoid mirrors, windows. We all know we do that. Stop. Okay. Then I think, hmm, I mean, there are other things we can do. Like for instance, I've talked about this a lot, but you can thank your body for the things it's done. And yes, I know it's still a little body focus, but it helps you be more grateful for what your body's done and not let that eating disorder voice get in there and be the only thing that you hear. And this can be things like, thank you lungs for breathing. You allow me to live. Thank you eyes for seeing. Thank you fingers for gripping. Um, thank you feet for balancing. Just the other day, I was like, I'm so thankful for my mobility. It would be so mentally difficult for me, not to mention physically, but mentally difficult for me if I couldn't go for walks or do yoga. Like that's just part of how I live you guys. And so you have to say thank you to your body. And so you can definitely get into that, um, that kind of thought cycle and that can help a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest thing will just be the distractions, things that you do that can't, don't allow the eating disorder thoughts in at all. And if that, that could even be spending time with a friend. We all have that friend that's like really funny, has a lot of good ideas, wants to talk a lot, so emotive. Spend time with that friend because they're just like a party all in one. And then we can't really think about anything else. Um, yeah. And I think having some of those things written down so you can easily access them like on your phone, like put them in your, in your notes or something so you can get them anytime, you know, day or night. We have to try to make these work for any time because we, I know, trust me, I know all of you are, te- you've told me over the years and I know this personally, nighttime is the worst. <laughs> I just had to fight the urge because Sean and I, 
I don't know what this quote is from. It's like a movie. I'll put it in the comments if you remember, but it's like nighttime is the right time. It's like this crazy accent from a ridiculous person in a, in a show. And every time I say nighttime, I think that anyway, but nighttime is when the thoughts are their worst and they can really get to us. So make sure you have something that you can do at night. Okay. And then let me know if that helps. If you need more, I got more. Okay. Question number eight. Can you recommend any tips to help stop painful past memories from suddenly popping into my head at random times of the day and night? I'm fed up and exhausted from reliving all the sad emotions it brings up. I, the, you're not going to like my answer. I'm sorry. So while distractions can help, these intrusive thoughts, which is kind of what I would call them, there are thought stopping techniques that we can do. Um, but that's not really what's happening because these are painful past memories, I would, I'd be curious if these are like trauma memories and the only way, so here's something interesting. When our, when our brain and body feel safe and they're like, Hey, we haven't had a trauma in a little while. I think it's okay. I think we're okay now. I think we can start to heal. And what that means is that our brain, instead of doing all that stuffing down, right? For years, it'll stuff these things down. And we have all those like shattered marbles of trauma memories that are like scattered all through our, the, the floor of our brain. This is just an analogy from Inside Out. If you don't know um, the movie Inside Out, the memories are these marbles that she stored. I just, it's such a beautiful like metaphor. It's just so great, you guys. Anyway, so the memories go into these marbles and they roll them away to file the memory. But trauma memories are like that marble gets dropped on the cement floor and like, tush, it shatters everywhere. And so when we can't deal, our brain kind of like sweeps them off to the side and it's like, la, 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 la. I can't, I can't deal with it. Can't do it right now. And then when we finally feel safe and our brain and body are like, oh, wow, that sucked, but we made it. Okay. And then it wants to start to process them because it doesn't want to mess like that. It needs to process. It's like part of how we heal. It's part of how we move forward healthfully. And so it, that's when we'll have flashbacks. That's when we'll have these trauma or, you know, hurtful big T or little T. Big T meaning it could be like a big car accident or we were physically abused or sexually abused. Little T's could be like we moved a lot growing up. Um, and these are not ranked. I'm not saying big T's are bigger or more important than little T's. I'm just saying they both can lead to trauma-like responses and PTSD symptoms. But little T's can be like, my parents got divorced. I had to move a lot as a kid. I was bullied for a couple of years in school, not terribly bullied, but like, you know, enough that I was uncomfortable. Or there was that one time my dad shouted at me and I swore he was going to hurt me. Um, those are all, and those all stack up too. And so anyways, my guess would be that these are popping up because it's safe and it's time to process. And so that's my first like gut reaction to this is I think that that processing through those painful memories and therapy will stop these from popping up. However, intrusive thoughts suck. And some of us have those. And those can just be crazy thoughts. And we're like, why am I thinking about this? This is terrible. It didn't, why? Ugh. And I'm not talking about like intrusive thoughts related to OCD, because that's a whole nother ball of wax we're not going to get into today. But when it comes to just having thoughts pop up randomly that are icky, that make us feel sad, or, and they're just bad memories, but it's not a trauma. We don't think it's a trauma. It's just, ugh, I don't like it. And it's sad and it makes me feel bad about myself. The best way to thought stop is to force our brain into an old memory, one of our favorites. Mm. Maybe even write a couple little starter lines down so you have those memories to pull from. Maybe it's like, okay, I know this is very focused on my life experience, but that's just, that's what I got right now. Um, I remember when I was a kid, so I grew up in the country and my dad hunted. I know if that offends you, you know, you could be offended. Um, however, it was just part of how we fed ourselves. We didn't have a ton of money. So my dad would go hunting. And um, when I was little, I loved to, I loved my dad. I want to be with my dad all the time. I was a total daddy's girl. And so he would let me put in my color crayons and color books and toys into the back of our Bronco. We had this Bronco too. And it was like cream and brown colored. And anyway, I, he would put me in the back when I was still asleep because you'd leave to go hunting at like six in the morning. And so I'd still be asleep. And then I'd wake up and we'd be like out on a dirt road, you know, out hunting quail or deer or whatever. So that's one of my good memories. And I could really go down a rabbit hole. Like I remember my mom made the best ham sandwich. It's just, you know, you let yourself go through a memory in as much detail as possible. Are there any smells that you remember? Do you remember what you were wearing? How did, how did that fabric feel on your body? Um, 
you know, what did you see? What did you uh, taste? Did you eat anything? Go through as many of your senses as possible. Remember in much detail as you can and poof, those, that nasty thought that came into your mind, it's gone. You've focused so hard on that one memory, that one pleasant, happy, good memory. You can't remember the other. And so that's a great thought stopping technique. And that's the one that works the best for me. But if you have others, you can leave them in those comments below. Okay, how much time do we have? Have I been talking for a long time? I have. Okay, last question. Question number nine. That tends to be, I guess, what we get through. Because I think in the last one, I got through nine because I thought I'd, I thought I'd get through like 20. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I talk a lot. Okay, question number nine is medication versus talk therapy for depression. Now, honestly, I think both. Both is best because like think back to our earlier conversation about mental illnesses and healing from them. Um, If we think about it in the way of physical illness, uh, just taking medication would be like if we have, uh, let's say we have the flu real bad or pneumonia or anything. And all we do is take the medicine and we don't change our behavior at all. We still work out. We still go to work every day. We don't get extra sleep or drink extra water. We Maybe we even go out for drinks with our friends on Friday because that's what we would normally do. It's going to take you so much longer, potentially put you back in the hospital. And you might even get sicker day after day after day. Mental illness is no different. Depression is no different. Talk therapy is the behavioral changes, the thought stopping, the t- techniques and tools to help you feel better so that you don't always need that medication or medication and therapy. Maybe you need them both. It'll give you the best outcome in the quickest way possible. It's really like research. I mean, you got, you can do your own Google scholaring and get some articles. Uh, We used to call them green books, but I forget what, I'm sure they're not even real books anymore because I'm older, but they used to send out the, it was like new research that's being done. Maybe they still send them. I don't know. Um, but anyway, you can look up and new research is being, you know, done. It's exciting. It's very cool. But I would even assume new, old, whatever, the best outcomes come from therapy and medication together. Okay. So when it comes to depression, I think you need both. Um, not everybody needs medication. But everybody needs talk therapy. And that's not just because I'm a therapist. That's just the truth. Depression can get, we can get caught in these like negative thought spirals. And without any tools, we can find ourselves getting back in there more quickly and without realizing it. And therapy allows us to better understand our symptoms, have tools to stop them before it spirals out of control. And, you know, gives us a place to talk about it and get some real insight versus us just like ruminating in our own uh, because depressed minds seek out depressed things. I don't know if you guys have, if I've said that before, but like if we're feeling really down and out, we'll want to listen to sad, depressive music, watch sad, depressive films, read quotes that support faulty thoughts and bad thinking. Um, We'll find negativity online. Like what we're looking for, because if all our brain is filled with is depression, sad, put down negative thoughts, we're going to seek that out or create it. Um, We can get into maybe heated fights on Twitter or something because we feel so shitty. Um, And that's why we need talk therapy. And then I always talk about medication. You guys know this as like a life raft. It gets our head above water and it allows us to be able to do the behavioral things. Because I know for many of you, you're like, but I'm so depressed. I can't shower the two times a week my therapist is wanting me to. I can't uh, text that one friend. I can't uh, go to school, you know, or go to work, these number of dates, like I just can't do any of the things. I can't write what I'm grateful for. I can't even think about that. That's where medication comes in handy because it gets our head out of all the symptoms enough that we can do the things in therapy that can hopefully make us feel better. Because I know many of you are like, well, I don't want to be on medication for the rest of my life. Awesome. You might not have to, but we have to give ourselves a chance to like breathe so we can do the techniques and tools that our therapist is sharing with us. Okay. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed these. These are actually very fun. Um, Yeah, and I promise I'll get better at this too. And I'm curious, um, in the comments below, let me know if you think that I should break these into, because as I'm doing this, this it's only my second time, right? So we're new at this. Um, But I'm curious if maybe I try to do podcasts around like one topic. So like I take all your questions and I look through them and try to put like, you know, depression is one podcast and eating disorders is another or whatever. Um, let me know if you'd prefer that or if you kind of like that it's it's varied. 
I'm just curious because as I think about this, I'm like, would I want to listen? I think I might want it to be varied, but maybe it'd be easier for me to pop in if I knew what I was getting into. If I was like, hey, I'm struggling with depression. I'm going to listen to this one because it's going to be all about the thing that I need help with. Um, anyway, let me know. If you haven't subscribed, um, subscribe to in these um, subscribe to the podcast itself. Please leave reviews. Five-star reviews are welcomed. Um, and also, you know, I like the idea that this is on uh, YouTube as well. So you can leave those comments below and I'll try to get into there um, and check those out. And without further ado, I will uh, see you and you'll hear from me next week. Bye. You can ask her about your therapist or vent about your work. You can ask her about your self-esteem or why your feelings hurt. You can ask her why breakups suck or why you've hit a plateau. Inquire all.